Adam, are you ready? Adam? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Cool. Oh, I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. All right. So we're going live. Give me a second. All right. So do I need to like, are you sending me something like through text that I need to link to Facebook or I'm not exactly no, sure? No, no, no. No, we're going to do it on text on thing. I'm asking you to start your video. So go ahead and do that. Okay. Gotcha. I just mean you had said something about a link to Facebook or something. No. Okay. We're live. So, um, uh, cool. All right. Cause I didn't, uh, I mean, I didn't do that, man. It's okay. How's it sound? All right. I mean, it's a crappy camera and a crappy mic. It's a little bit of background. Hey everyone, we are live here again from Facebook and live, YouTube live and Instagram. This is Carlos from Coral View. And um, uh, I just wanted to say hello. Thank you, hoping everybody is safe with us. And we have quite a treat today. Actually, we have uh, Adam from Battle Corals. He's gonna be um, joining us today and answering questions and all your secrets about growing <laughs> corals and uh, what do they call it? The secret sauce is what everybody's calling it out there. Sure, so sure. The questions. So there is no secret of, sauce. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. A little bit of background. We posted online and uh, a questions and said, hey, share questions. We're going to have Adam at Battle Corals come and join us. And it was amazing how many people want to ask you questions, my I friend. Know. I know, I saw that. In fact, I think I'm going to go back and answer some of those that don't get touched on here because uh, a lot of that is stuff that I would love to touch on anyway. But continue. Yeah, but you know what? I see Jiminy Easy at Home Haircuts. First of all, thank you for joining us. And second of all, this is the best looking blocks in the block right here, you know? Easy haircuts. Oh, yeah. And, you, know, we just, <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, no, you know, shaving your head makes you look younger. Uh, well, it's, I'll tell you what, when you, uh, when you go, when you lose it young, you don't go through that when you're older. It all happened. Like that's old history for me. Anyway, we don't have to, I mean, it's actually, like, it's, actually, it's harder to you to lose it when you're young. I know. Cause we both, we actually both lost it around the same time. Oh yeah. Well, but what I'm saying is then when you hit your forties or fifties, like you've been there, done that. This isn't something that's going to cause you any grief. You know what I mean? Like yeah, everyone, everyone our age now is losing it and you know, it, whatever, it doesn't matter to me anymore. <laughs> yeah, we so, can go on and on. I know, I know, I know, I know. So anyway, um, before we start, before we yeah. start, or, or now that we've started, okay, Battle Corals, it's battlecorals.com. And um, one thing I have to say about you, and everybody agrees here, I think is your website is, I've, I've said this for years, fantastic man oh my god talk about taking corals to a completely different level you were the gallery you 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 set the standard in terms of color coral pictures and frag pictures that everybody else kind of try to copy mm -hmm. i mean i so appreciate that i mean i got to give a lot of credit to my developer i mean i don't know if you saw the old site uh you know the one that i kind of created on my own uh it was kind of a mess. I mean, I did the best I could with old pictures and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, about five years ago, uh, you know, I had gotten a lot of uh, 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 people asking me, you know, can I help you re redesign your site and so forth. And, and a guy named Nick out in Washington finally uh, really captured my interest. And he showed me some uh, examples and stuff that he was working on. And, uh, and it was kind of like a match made in heaven. We kind of both of our ideas just blended really well. And we kind of ended up with that wall of coral look. And I owe a lot of the, the design, uh, you know, uh, concepts to him. And uh, and when we were doing the site, I ended up shooting, uh, reshooting all my coral as well. So kind of out of the deal, I ended up with all new fresh photographs. And uh, and I really owe a lot of that to him. That's Nick out in uh, in Washington. I'm my developer. I couldn't do it without him. So I'll give him a little. Nick, a Nick, you, you rock, man, because right. um, uh, going to your website makes me want to get your corals. I mean, it's like, and uh you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I've sure. gotten a few of your corals and I, and I, and we were just, we were just chatting about it yesterday, uh, text messages like, man, it's like, I can't believe that my corals are looking the same way that they look on the website and they do people. They absolutely well, do. You have to, you have to care for them. You have to love them. You have to give them the right food and the right light. But if you do, oh my God, your corals, they look exactly like Adam's. 
and that's and the amazing I, thing about it. I appreciate that. I mean, the thing is with my photography, it's really easy to uh, embellish features and you know make things look like they don't appear. And uh, you know, all that means is you know when people get them, they never it, it'll never look like what it looks like on my site. And you kind of just reaffirming that uh, ultimately, you know, it's easy to kind of make a slider, you know, change a color uh, a little bit beyond what it should be. But uh, you know, all that all that does is kind of create disappointment. I mean, if you get a coral for me and you can never get it to look like you know my picture, well then you know I think that would be my fault more so than yours uh, because I probably it ruined the photo or something like that. But but uh, essentially, yeah. like I, I work really hard on uh, you know representing my corals best as I can, so you don't get disappointed because it is. I mean, nothing's worse than you know getting a bunch of garbage and, and just having to spend all your time trying to make it look like you like you think it's going to look. You know, I mean, we could go on and on about photography, but, you know, one of my main, uh, you know, one of my main objectives has always been to, to replicate, you know, what you will hopefully see in your tanks, you know, and kind of what I'm seeing you know, with my own eyes, uh, with my yeah. photography. And I mean, I guess it's nice to hear compliments. I mean, I, every once in a while, I, I hear that where people say like, wow, I mean, it really does look like your picture. And, uh, and that's really, I mean, that always makes my day. I mean, I can't, I can't thank you enough. And even coming from you, uh, I mean, a veteran, uh, you know, far <laughs> older than I, than I am, uh, I know, you know I mean, it's like, like we can even kind of touch on that. Like, there's no real secret sauce. I mean, like, I mean, these are what they. This is what they look like. It's genetics, if anything. I mean, when it comes uh, to like, specific coloration and that sort of thing. But yeah, you know, I, I'm no wizard, man. No doubt about that. <laughs> so, but one of the first questions that we had that we asked people is, how did you start? When did you start? When did when did Adam become a hobbyist? And then when did it when did it transition into battle corals, the the aquaculture farm? It's a good question. I'm going to uh, to kind of give you the quick the quick version because this goes back quite a while. Uh, but you know, around the turn of the uh, the the early aughts, maybe 2000 2001, you know, I got a little interested in tanks, and there was a local uh, you know fish store around here that I kind of went and got a tank and. You know, when you get a small tank, the next thing, all you want is a bigger tank. So what started out as a 10 gallon tank turned into a 20 and then eventually into a 90. And, uh, you know, as you know, even back then it was metal halide lighting and that sort of thing. And you had to buy light bulbs and you had to buy salt. So for me, it was always, you know, light bulbs and salt. And, uh, and I started just selling as a hobbyist on, uh, on uh, Reef Central back then. You know, you, I remember you, of course. And, uh, you know, I sold here and there, I sold here and there. And I got to a point uh, where uh, DC, we all know where it's DC, but Debbie, uh, very, uh, uh, what's the word, politely uh, asked me to stop selling. She said I was considered a commercial hobbyist, which is a phrase I'll never oh. forget. Uh, but this happened, and it was literally that that day, uh, you know, I had been mulling around the idea of battle corals. I could go on about the history of that, but uh, um, I had been mulling around the idea of battle corals, which stemmed from an, another hobby, you know, decades before that, I was kind of involved in an underground uh, music scene in the Midwest. Uh, resuscitate the battle master was my moniker I guess if you want to even go back and give a little history so there was this kind of battle master uh, affiliation there and I had thought uh, battle master corals was kind of the original uh, uh, concept and that got truncated to uh, battle corals but uh, literally the day that Debbie this is DC at Reef Central now uh, you know kind of uh, essentially asked me to, to stop selling uh, I the light bulb went off I said okay I can do this let's call it battle corals I, I registered the domain and this was back in I think 2009 maybe and mm -hmm. uh you know as you can imagine you know i'm, I'm going on maybe it was 2001 uh, i think i'm getting on my ninth year either way whatever the math is uh you know what kind of started off as a hobby a necessity that i needed to to fund my own hobby turned into essentially a viable career path and again like this is a nerdy niche man and, and every day i wake up and, and i go upstairs and i do this i say to myself like i honestly can't believe it it's you know kind of a, uh, a cliche that yeah in that regard, but but, but I, I'm kind of living the dream. I mean, in a sense, like I've got a, I've got a job that's like I love to go to every day. And uh, and I got my uh, my my workers and, and the best stuff you can get around me. Now, yeah, that's awesome. But they're off home from school. But, uh, you know, long story short, you know, it started off as a hobby. And uh, and somehow I'm like one of the lucky few that managed to make it into a viable career. And uh, and I don't take it for granted. And believe me, every day that goes by that I get to go upstairs and look at what you're seeing now. Uh, it makes my day. I mean, it, it truly is. It's kind of what I live for. But anyway. What else you got? That's, a, that, that's great. I mean, um, uh, I remember personally back in, and yeah, I think it was nine years, 2009, because I remember you stopping by with Phil back in, it oh, was yeah. it 99 or 2000, I can't remember. It and was, you, it was and, like early and, 2000. Me and Chad, like, well, Chad, Chad was my first contact, my good buddy yes, Chad. And he knew yes. you, and you guys were all active on the Merck forums. And uh, you even sat down with me for, 
like an hour trying to get me to sign up on the Merck uh, forums, uh, you know, the chat room. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I was just like an idiot back then. I didn't know anything that I was doing. <laughs> And, uh, and I still, Ooh, you know, my learning. problem was the same problem that I have today is that I just can't type. I mean, if I could show you a, an email that I sent, I spend more time, there's more red lines that I got to fix, you know, than actually writing the message. But I will, I will spend, I would spend more time, uh, correcting my things that I'm trying to do on, on this chat room. And it was just, a, it was a, it was a bust. I mean, I couldn't compete. I couldn't keep up with you guys. <laughs> like you guys yeah. just chatting away. Like, I mean, yeah. uh, I'm trying to think of some of the, some of the names back then, but you know, yeah. Phil, of course, and, and all those old guys, but, but yeah, I remember uh, you stopped at the house and you were looking at my tank, and I just grabbed. I was like, "What do you want?" Check, 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 check. Here, oh, yeah. go home. Good old days. <laughs> well, you know, what, you know what blew me away most back then is you had uh, an apex connected to your tank, and you told me that you could have the apex turn the air conditioner on, and that yeah. just blew me away. I mean, I was just like, "This is like, this was is crazy. the craziest thing I've ever heard." I mean, all it these things. Like, you were way more into the technical aspect back then, anyway. Yeah, I was. And like, I mean, that just blew me away. I'm like, so you know, I've got like fans hooked up to like i mean just the most kind of archaic thing you can imagine and you've got this system where it turns on the air conditioning when it gets hot and i just thought like i mean that just blew oh, my, yeah, that was, my rocks my that was that was kind of cool but now i mean going into what we got now and years years later is uh you know coral being without making a plug is the core the control which which we you've gotten Ooh, a right. little bit of previews of it but uh yeah. this we'll is the like the wave engine kind of the, the, yes, the next yes goal. yes right. we'll talk about it later so yep. but let's go back to battle corals yes. and, and, and and you and your systems. And another question that a, another customer or another a fan of yours mm -hmm. had was with battle corals being a business, mm -hmm. do you still feel the same way about corals and the hobby mm -hmm. or has it become more of a business for you? Because you know what they say, when, when you turn a hobby into a viable business, then it stops being a hobby sometimes and it becomes work. So what do you feel about that? It does a fine line and kind of a two part question with a two part answer. Uh, you know, I'm way more sensitive. Like when my stuff dies, like I feel it, it hurts. You know, not only am I kind of emotionally attached to the coral, but like, I mean, when all of a sudden coral equals dollar signs, you know, it, it's way, you know, it becomes a bit more of like a, a problem or essentially something that can be stressed about. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I am just as excited, like when I, cause I order for a wholesale now and I go get to pick it up sometimes, I'm just as excited as when I was getting, you know, a frag pack back on Reef Central from a guy as I am now, like getting 10 Aussie colonies or something like that. I mean, like the excitement, uh, it, like it hasn't faded one bit. And I even like, I mean, sometimes I kind of, I think about that, but, uh, you know, to answer that question, yeah, man, like, uh, so far, I mean, going on maybe, I mean, as a hobbyist, maybe hitting the 15-year mark here, uh, my enthusiasm hasn't really faded at all. In fact, you know, when you invest in your house and you put a giant room on to, to grow coral, I mean, essentially, uh, yeah. all it means is I've, I mean, I've never been more gung-ho in my life. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that initial, like, draw, you know, to acros and such uh, is just as strong as ever. I mean, like, I get so excited because a lot of times I won't know exactly what they look like. I'll buy stuff based on pictures and, you know it's the same excitement, open up a bag and, and instead of just being a little frag, it seems like a wild collie and Aussie or something like that. And, uh, and I'm just as thrilled, man. Like, like when I know they're coming, it's the same feeling. And I, I hope, I think my customers maybe have that same, you know, sense, but like when you know you're getting coral, you're oh, getting yeah. coral, it's man. Like, that's that, it's like that's the feeling. Exactly. Exactly. And I, and it's, so, and I still get it like every time. I mean, it, the thrill hasn't gone. So good. good. So that brings, brings me to the next question, which mm -hmm. you touched upon, which is building a whole new section above your house to, to house the corals. So my question is, and somebody else's question was, mm -hmm. how does your family feel about that? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I've always had tons of support. I mean, there's never been, you know, I, I get a lot of, it's hilarious actually. I get a lot of uh, orders where husbands will give me some special instructions on how to like circumvent their wives. You know, can you leave invoices out or like leave the boxes? You know, I mean, so I mean, it's, it's adorable. And, and I mean, I, I get, I get a, I'm completely charmed by it. And I work with these guys all the time. Don't get me wrong. Like if you need me to, you know, conceal something for you, I certainly will. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I have had nothing but support. I mean, my wife is great. Uh, you know, at no point has, even when I was a hobbyist and spending all this money and kind of like, you know, there was no money coming in, you know, yeah, I got to buy light bulbs. Uh, there was never been any resistance or like, you know, this is getting kind of, you know, like I feel, I feel fortunate because I've heard lots of stories about, you know, people kind of having to, and I'm not going to just pick on whites, but, you know, whites <laughs> being a little bit more financially, uh, you know, interested in what's going on and what, where money's going when people are buying coral. It just, it's, it can be an expensive hobby. Uh, you know, all of a sudden when, when, when the turning point happened where like money was actually being generated, I mean, then it became like essentially a viable career path. It was something that like, I kind of believed that I could maybe pull off and, uh, 
you know, again, without the support, I mean, if I had, if I was had my head up against a brick wall or something that whole time, maybe I don't know that I'd be where I am today in that regard as well. I mean, I've had even like my parents, you know, there was a time where, uh, you know, when we first met, I was still there and I had these ugly frag tanks in the basement. I mean, like I've never really had anyone kind of pulling me down, you know, since I started even doing awesome. this the hobby. So, you know, I guess I can accredit a lot of my success to that and like support that I've had, you know, from day one. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Um, um, let's do a little segue right here. We sure. are going to be going, we are going to, um, for everybody, Adam has been fantastic and kind enough to um, uh, donate a giveaway. So um, uh, it's going to be a 1000 and I mean a $1,000 yep. battle box. All right. And then what you're going to do is we are going to give you a special code during these during the video so you got to make sure that you're watching and then you're going to go we're going to give you a special uh, a link and then you're going to go and all you got to do is type in the special code and that link and then we will contact you via email via email if you've won so the to get into the draw you just got to type in the special code we just got to make sure that you're watching you know that's that's cool. just the way it is um, um but that's it's simple that's it. You don't have to ask a question. All you got to do is listen for the code, which we'll give you. We'll, we will give it to you later and then go to the link, which we'll post at the end of the video. And you just do that. Cool. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, you remember we had I don't know if you saw it, but we had a little stream, uh, a little cooking competition, uh, cooking show. Yes. Uh, last you week. Know, with, I, with I, saw Alex. A couple of, I saw a couple of threads about that. Yeah, man. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So anyway, we have um, um, in a. Uh, uh, in order for our, uh, we want to know what the fan favorite is for the dishes. There were there were 14 people that actually cooked the dish and and posted it. So we've created at Coralview uh, at the Coralview Facebook page. We've created a little album, and Alex wants to know who the fan favorite is. So go into the album and comment on the the picture that you like, and then the picture with the most comments will 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 be the the fan favorite and tell Alex, and then we will announce the winner of the Abyss Pump once we're done with this stream. Nice. Okay. Nice. Very I know cool. that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's so going cool. back, to, going back to battle corals sure. and uh, one of the, um, another question that a customer had here was um, um, considering that you have been in the hobby for so long as a hobbyist and as a coral farmer, I mean, you're one of the oldest ones around. Um, it's funny. I mean, it, that even I, think of, I mean, I think about guys like Mike Paletta though, and like, you know, Tyree yeah. and that, and like, I'm like, I know, but, I'm, but, I'm still like a, like a kid in that regard. But anyway. Yes, ex anyway, but anyway, so people say that they know you as the SBS Jedi. Jedi. I, I was like, I was floored, which is kind of cool. And I do, I do, I do it. appreciate that. Cause that's actually, you know what I've known Adam and that he's got the green thumb but anyway, but time for, from time to time, You've had issues with SBS. You've had problems where like um, um, uh, RTN and, and rapid tissue necrosis and, S, and SDN slow tissue necrosis. And so even though you're a coral farmer and, and you're the Jedi, hmm. things happen to you, right? Oh, man. It's a story of my life. I mean, at no point ever do I have 100% uh, like healthy corals. I mean, it's almost like uh, the exact opposite. And this is kind of a funny thing. Uh, I had intended to do a write-up on this exact subject years ago, and I think maybe like a little trepidation. I didn't really want to like uh, kind of a man behind the curtain uh, kind of thing, but I always called it the uh, illusion of grandeur. Uh, and kind yeah. of a, a phrase I came up with, like people have this, this you know, notion that like I have these giant, healthy, sprawling colonies and just this wonderful thing and everywhere, you know, coral everywhere I look and coral everywhere I, you see. And, uh, and the truth is, is, you know, my corals are absolutely abused. I mean, they're, they're beaten up, they're abused, they're fragged. I mean, they're, they're ugly by any sense of the word. Like my mother colonies are nothing like the colonies that end up in people's tanks that they don't get messed with all the time. I mean, they're, they're in a constant state of recovery. And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, the illusion of grandeur is something that uh, I think maybe bodes well for uh, the vendor. But uh, I mean, on a professional level of people, how they view it, but like, it, like the actual kind of inner workings of what goes on is a lot uglier than that. And I guess part of me never really wanted to write that right up because again, it's kind of like the man behind the curtain thing or like, you know, the sauce attractor, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but my, my colonies are, are, are bashed. I mean, like nothing is really like healthy. I lose stuff all the time. Uh, you know, I, a lot of times I'll also say, I try not to get too attached. You know, there's just something that, you know, it's SPS and whether you like it or not, uh, they're going to do odd stuff. You got, if you're doing everything right, uh, if, you're, if you think you're doing everything right, they're still going to do stuff that puzzles you or that you can't make sense of. No matter what 
no matter what it is or even what you think it is, uh, you might, you'll never figure it out. So, I mean, from my perspective, you know, it, it always sucks when I lose colonies or just out of the blue, like, wow, what's going on here? Uh, but at the same time, I, I did another write-up a while back about kind of the roller coaster of, you know, necrosis and, you know, like, how do you really, like, kind of mentally uh, uh, deal with it, you know, when, when you have no idea what's going on? And, uh, and the long story short is, I guess, try not to get too attached. Two things I say a lot, try not to get, not to get too attached, and that's SPS, man. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they, they just die. And, and uh, the, good, the good news is it grows. And um, as of now, you know, it's, I'd like to say it's moderately replenishable that, you know, something that, you know, is not extinct or endangered yet to, to the point of, you know, if I lose it, it's gone for good. But, but uh, you know, I'm not, I, I'm no different than any hobbyist that struggles with coral man. It's, instead of having a tank full of maybe 30 colonies, I've got, you know, six tanks of, you know, quite a few hundred. And like I said, at no point are they all happy. I mean, not in a million years. In fact, they're usually mad at me because I've been handling them and, you know, cutting branches. I mean, they're in a constant state of like uh, recovery. So, okay. you know, again, the illusion of grandeur, it, it is a thing. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> it just... Well, this, this leads me to another question. Okay. And this is another question from another customer is, um, obviously, the course, even though you're chopping them off and some of them are not happy, they are happy in the uh, in in the overall scheme. It's a fine and, balance and for because, sure. Because you're doing you're doing something here. So what everybody wants to know, I think, is give me your parameters. What is what do you usually keep your alkalinity at? What do you like sure. it at? Uh, you know, I've kind of gone there and back on that. Uh, I have been roughly around eight five nine for a long time now, okay. and, and I've kind of experimented with higher and lower, but it seems like that's kind of been. Uh, I don't know if I call it a sweet spot, but that's kind of been the point where it seems like I can maintain it easily and everything seems to be gelling uh, at that. Okay. So, you know, so kind of eight, five, calcium eight, reactor. Five to nine. Yep. Eight, five to nine with a calcium reactor. Like not too what high, about, not too low. <laughs> what's, your, what's your calcium level at? Uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of old school and, and I don't really test calcium. I kind of, you know, I'm using a reactor, right? So I know that I'm adding a balanced mix and I know that if my, you know, if my alkalinity is around 9.5, my... Uh, or 8.5, my calcium is probably balanced at about 424, you know, 25. Uh, but whenever I get it like a ICP test done, I do get my actual calcium, you know, from that. I haven't had a calcium test on site for probably five, six years now. Uh, and the okay. one that I had was probably expired, had been expired for years. But, you know, <laughs> what essentially, I like to think that my calcium is balanced to whatever my alkalinity is kept at. Which okay. is, what about, your magnesium? What about uh, your magnesium? Again, another thing, it's always low. Uh, but, you know, roughly not something I test for a lot, but uh, when I get ICP tests, I'm usually in the 300 to four, 13 to 1400, you know, kind of about where it should be, not too high, not too low, uh, you know, pretty standard on that one. But okay. again, not, so not key... something I test for uh, really anymore at all. And maybe that's not a good thing, but, but uh, I don't know, <laughs> no comment. So the, so the key ingredient in here is, is, um, uh, is you don't chase numbers. You don't want to be eight and eight point five right. right in there. If you're somewhere between eight point five and nine, that's a, that's a normal range. If you're sure. around thirteen, fourteen hundred on the on the magnesium, that's a good range. And if you're on the the four hundred to four fifty calcium, you're fine. You're not going to be chasing the numbers like no, some people no, do. No, not at all. It will drive you nuts. For sure. I mean, absolutely. And I think uh, pH is one that people like to chase a lot. And, and I think the jury's <laughs> still out for me. You know, when in the spring when my windows are open uh, versus winter, there's always you know, some kind of weird hiccups that I think I experienced because of potential pH fluctuations. But, you know, when people say that I need to, I need to get five, you know, 8.4 and I'm going to do whatever I can to get there. Uh, I think it causes more, it's like, a, uh, causes more problems than, than it just yeah. letting it kind of rest at, at, at like a stasis where it would normally be. But. What about your salinity? salinity uh, we've di we've oh, discussed this yeah. one and I know you have right, a very, right. uh, an orthodox, uh, salinity measurement in there. It's a fluke thing. And uh, oddly enough, my backup system, I run two systems, kind of a main and kind of a redundant backup system that's smaller. Uh, I have been letting my backup creep down a little bit closer to 1027, uh, you know, roughly. But normally, I'm still running my main about 1028. Uh, you know, I've got a thread and a long discussion about kind of how and why this came about. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, it kind of falls into the if it ain't broke, don't fix a category, uh, meaning that it, it kind of got high on its own and things were looking good. And, uh, and it's been that way for a long time now. But, but as I said, I, I am kind of starting to experiment with bringing it back down almost because it's kind of happening organically in the backup as well. Like I said, mm -hmm. 1027, you know, when I take water off of ores and stuff like that, you know, it's a very crude system to kind of uh, keep that balance. But 
uh, I've been considering letting it kind of fall down and just to kind of see uh, my back and my back is obviously a bit more of an experimental tank and I can, you okay. know, I mean, just that's where I can kind of mess around with stuff like that. And just kind of see, essentially see what happens. <laughs> Okay. One thing that is hugely important in uh, growing corals, even in your tank or a farm, besides the parameters, I and mean, we cover the basic parameters now, um, I'm, I'm, uh, your phosphates, usually, what? You know, that's another thing. Like, I have kind of gone back and forth. Uh, I started feeding a couple different kinds of foods, primarily uh, refroids, and I got a couple of friends that kind of swear by it. And I noticed that phosphates have gone up and, you know, this may shock people. I know people follow me, but I've kind of been on the, you know, high phosphates are okay wagon for a long time and kind of vocal about, you know, using things like GFO and that sort of thing. Uh, but I have actually been using GFO after about with considerably high phosphates. I had some weird problems with my tank last year, uh, some structural issues with my floor that caused a, a huge problem. Uh, and I had a, and a massive phosphate spike. Um, you know, another thing, I don't really test for it. Anytime I get an ICP test back, I will see about where my phosphates are. And, uh, you know, again, not a number that I really chase, not a number that I, I'll tell you what, the only time I've really had, and I've said this like a broken record to a lot of people that we've had this conversation, but uh, the only time I've really had visible, obvious problems with my coral, like reduced polyp extension, or maybe kind of that faded uh, tissue look was when my phosphates bottomed out. Like when I got, when I was at oh. zero phosphates, I could tell something was wrong, you know, versus yes. like when they start getting, when they start getting up there, I don't know. I would, I've never been able to like make that connection. Like, okay, high phosphates, that's happening versus like mm -hmm. they are zero now and everything looks kind of crappy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, you know, I think chasing like zero phosphate is not a good idea. I mean, if I had no, to no. say it, uh, and the phosphorus, I guess, uh, I, I do have one of those little green egg, uh, all, you know, phosphorus testers and I'll, I'll bust it out every once in a while to kind of, conf I'll tell you what, whenever I send in an ICP test, that's when I'll check it just to see if it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of what it is to, to base it on the ICP test. But, so what are you uh, keeping them around uh, a point, point 0.5, point, you know, one or something like that? I mean, with the system, man, that I it's, it's I, hard. I it's hard. have no idea what my fossil is right okay. now. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> do you what? have any, any hair algae, any algae? Um, Not really. I've seen your well, systems. The, and... the thing is, I kind of do. And, you know, I, I employ a lot of rabbit fish and a lot of things that graze. And, you know, there's a fine balance. And I'm, and I'm always one of those guys that I'm not really afraid of hair algae. I mean, you know, I don't mm -hmm. want to scare customers. There's none on my plugs. I probably, well, there might be some, but you know, ultimately I don't have a problem with it, but I'm not the kind of guy that if I see a little tuft here, like I'm going to fix it on until it's gone and do everything I can to get rid of it. Like I don't, unless it's taking over the tank, which fortunately I haven't had that kind of a problem. Uh, I don't see like some tufts of green hair algae anywhere as a, as a huge concern for me. Again, you know, like as long as, uh, you know, if anything is maybe free food for my hungry rabbit fish, and uh, maybe a little something that kind of moves a little bit because uh, you know echoes don't you know some little hair algae waving in the in the in the in the whatever in the flow but uh, not something I guess I don't really concern myself now again I I'm not talking about a display tank so maybe my opinions would change mm -hmm. if I had a, a display tank full of hair algae uh, but again I always kept rabbit fish and grazers so you know it's, okay. it's a balance it's a balance so. You know, with the rabbit fish and everything and the feeding, mm -hmm. I'm guessing your nitrates are, are going to be somewhere up there. Um, you're probably not going to have zero, but it's probably not going to be crazy because things are growing, I'm assuming. Yeah, and I think, you know, nitrates I have tested recently, and I think I was like around 10 or 15. I don't know. If, I mean, truly, mm, wow. I mean, that, that's not something that, you know, again, not, uh, you know, nutrients, I don't really fixate on them. I think that, uh you know, good skimming and like moderately decent husbandry, it, it keeps all that stuff in check. And, you know, again, I don't have a ton of fish. I mean, for the amount of water I've got, my fish load is pretty low uh, in that regard. So, you know, even compared to like a hobbyist with a tank full of fish, that might be something they would need to be a little bit more diligent about. But, you know, maybe, I, you know, I may underestimate, uh, you know, a large volume of water and, and a relatively smaller amount of fish uh, versus, uh, you know, another write-up I did a while back was on how acros essentially do act as a, as a form of nutrient reduction. Uh, in their own right. So, you know, if you've got a lot of SPS, you know, they will be absorbing some of that in, in some form or another. Uh, at least I, I believe that, I, you know, that's kind of a, of, a, of an anecdote in a sense. Yeah. You know, we have a comment here, James Silva. It says, funny, I tell, I tell this to people all the time and they jump on me. They don't know how old school way is. And uh, you touched upon that. I mean, it's like, I, you know, you and I pretty much old school, which means that I pretty much like you just, Watch my alkalinity. If my alkalinity is spot on, I know my calcium and my magnesium are fine. I test 
put, I test phosphates and nitrates because I have them. But the three of them, if mm -hmm. you test one and it's fine, the other two are probably going to be okay. Relative. And you have to, and you have to read your corals. At the end of the day, your right. corals will tell you. Right. Yeah. And that's for me by, by far my biggest barometer. You know what I mean? Kind of like yes. I touched on before, like it was very obvious to me, essentially what happened, I can give you a good example. When I first set up the main system, I mean, everything was kind of new and, and that sort of thing. And I had a massive, uh, like a lot of the glass was just covered in kind of this nice tufty algae. Uh, and, and it sucked all the phosphate out of the system. And, uh, and this was very early on, like three years ago, kind of when I started upstairs and, uh, uh, it was very obvious. I mean, it was very simple and uh, it was because my nitro or my phosphate bottomed out and corals weren't happy and, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, there's been a couple examples where it was, it, there was no, there was no, uh, uh, I mean, it was clearly obvious to me, like what was going on, like the relationship mm -hmm. between low nutrients and coral behavior compared to uh, elevated nutrients. I, I don't know that, you know, that, that I don't, I guess I, I think that's something that even, well, even back in, the thing is back in the day, it was all about low, 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 low nutrients, low nutrients. And that kind of, you know, that kind of shifted. And then now we've kind of settled on a, on a place where people kind of understand that low nutrients isn't necessarily the greatest thing. And, and I think if anything, maybe filtration has gotten better. I mean, in the last oh, 15 yes. years, of course, you know, so Absolutely. we've got filters that, that can, and we've got ways to clean the water way better than we did 15 years ago in, in a lot of ways. And, and uh, but my system's pretty old school by that. I mean, I don't, like I said, that little, my little bout with GFO is about the closest I've come to like modern reefing, uh, you know, <laughs> in 15 years. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. Which brings me to the next, the next big, I'm not going to call it parameter, but element. Mm -hmm. And that is um, lighting. You are sure. one of the very, you are actually, I think not one of the very few, you're actually the only, the only website that when you sell frags, you actually allow people to choose mm -hmm. if, if, if the option is available of a frag of this coral grown on their metal halides, LEDs, or T5s. Now, mm -hmm. for personal preferences, and I know that um, uh, I know what the answer is going to be myself because I know you, but I, I don't think people will ever know what the real answer to what your favorite light is. And uh, I think everybody's going to be shocked about it because it's, it's, it's no longer around and it's one of the ugliest lights there is. Oh, well, the 65K, right, right. I mean, as far as halide goes, you know, and, and this is, I'll be honest, this is a little bit before my time. Like when I first got in, we had XM10Ks and that sort of thing. So I wasn't running uh, Iwasaki's with, with super actinics. Uh, you know, like a lot of you guys were, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I started getting into propagating, you know, I kind of came upon, uh, for one, they were cheaper because no one was buying them. I would get, I would get them from premium in the discount bin and, uh, and, and I couldn't deny how well they worked. I mean, I had been running, and this is kind of before, uh, LEDs were really on the, on the scene hard, but, uh, I mean, I had a lot of stuff growing under, uh, you know, radiums and stuff that was growing under 65 and there were colors that were coming out of those corals that the, the, the radiums were not producing in any way. I mean, I always thought it was like a punch. You know, they had a lot of punch and obviously a lot of par, uh, very underwhelming. I mean, I, I wouldn't put them over my display tank, uh, mm -mm. but as far as a prop, from a propagation standpoint, by far the best halide bulb you can get in, at least in a 250 watt. And, uh, and I believe I may have just bought the last uh, bulk in existence as well. I've been getting them directly from <laughs> I, uh, from, you know, the I, I manufacturer. And every time yeah. I order them, you know, like I think a year ago they had 27 left and I was like, okay, I'm only going to get nine. And then it, it, we'll see how that goes. And I bought another. And the last time I checked, I think they might have had six left. I had bought them all since they had 27. So I'm the only one buying these at this point, even directly mm -hmm. from the factory. And uh, and I got a nice stash. I and mean, I probably got about six, seven years worth uh, to go. So yeah. when that day comes, when I when I use my last Iwasaki and I know I can't get any more, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Uh, probably we'll just switch over to T5 or LED or, or maybe something better will have come along by then. But okay. uh, I'm, I'm well secured. Uh, at least I'm only running one high halide tank right now for sure. Three, mm -hmm. uh, you know, three on uh, M80 ballast, so they don't run quite as long. But, uh, you know, if you want to ask me what my favorite, like, I mean, I do get that. Favorite, act, light, you know, so, favorite oh. light today besides the Iwasaki. Is it LED? Right, is it right. T5s or is it, or is it, or is it, or is it uh, I know the hell Super tough. I tell you, it's a super tough. It's like almost an unanswerable question. But I can come up with a hundred things I like about each. And at the end of the day, the Iwasaki's grown a little faster. I'm not going to say they don't. I mean, it would be silly of me to say that they don't, but there are trade-offs completely. I think mm -hmm. if I had to take all three, I mean, because I've got colonies under each light, I can see very clearly like what's going on with each light. And, you know, if I had to choose, the corals that kind of stand out as the most kind of like 
vigorous growth and kind of like almost like the healthiest are the T5 road bulls for sure. And I think mm. that's just because of the, the coverage. I mean, they're mm -hmm. like that T5 really gets light in all the nooks and crannies and, uh, you know, versus I don't know that the halides or the, the LED, as far as like growth and speed, it's pretty close. I mean, there's nothing that may, is making me say, oh, this is way better than that. Or this is way better than that. And again, from a propagation standpoint, it's a little different because I'm not worried about like aesthetics and spectrums as much. You know, I run a lot of 65 KT5s and my LEDs are on 100%. So, I mean, it's, there's nothing, I mean, they don't, things don't look great, you know, aesthetically, but like it's, I'm more concerned with kind of power and, and, and that sort of thing. Okay. So question right here. Um, um, T5 lights, um, how far above the water line do you have them? Uh, my T5s are about 15 inches off the water. And mind you, you know, these are shallow tanks. There's only about four or five inches yes. of water, you know, from okay. the top to, you know, so the corals are, are you know, roughly... You know, there's about four walk, four inches of water you know, between the surface and, and actually touching them, and uh, and then 15 think, inches above ab, 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 above the water. About 12, 15. I think I see par under most of my T5s uh, at the water surface, still in dry, about five to six hundred. And then as soon as it gets under the water, I'm about four at the corals, roughly. What about LEDs? How far away from the water? Uh, good question. And uh, you know, I run. Uh, I know. This, uh, yeah, I've been running reef breeders. No, no secret there. Uh, they are roughly 25 inches above the water. And, uh, you know, the idea with this, you know, back when LEDs first came on, people would, uh, I'm not going to pick on them too much, uh, but there was this thing where people would, uh, they would say, like, I've got my, my radion, you know, three inches above the water and it's at like 10%. And, uh, and it didn't, I never understood that, especially coming from uh, being a halide user where it's just, it's all or nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. I never understood the idea of turning it down. <laughs> you know, why would you turn it down? So for me, I mean, especially from a propagating standpoint, uh, I get way more coverage with my LEDs turned way up and therefore I can mount them way higher you know, mm -hmm. kind of a kind of a no-brainer. I mean, at, at 25 inches, I still get about 600 uh, at, the, at the at the surface dry, and you know, roughly 450, 500 at the actual coral, and that's you okay. know, 25 inches uh, above. So the so the so the theme is about 400 to 500 oh, far sure. on the corals on absolutely, the corals themselves. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, definitely, that's, that's definitely the average. Okay, now, um, um, uh, what do you think is and switching gears now? Because we've gone over the parameters and everything, and now let's switch gears as to 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 the customers. Because at, at the end of the day, this live stream is to allow the customers to somewhat take the best of your suggestions, mm -hmm. take the best of what works for you, and recreate it at home. You know, sure. um, um, so what factors should a hobbyist consider before buying coral? You know, well, and that's a, it's a loaded question. So, sure. you know, just, just let's well, touch upon the, the, I think the, I've got a good answer. Things. I mean, tank yeah. age is probably the primary, uh, primary concern. I mean, you don't want to put acros in a two month old tank. Can you do it? Sure. I mean, you know, a lot of times, depending on where you're starting from a brand new tank, you're going to struggle. I mean, especially with dry rock these days, uh, you know, the one year mark is really kind of like the, like the, the safe zone, if you ask me. And <laughs> truth be told, uh, I started my main, you know, my new main with all dry rock. And the first year was pretty rough, man. I'd say around the nine month mark, I started seeing, you know, like all that algae and stuff that I was talking about earlier that dropped my phosphates. Um, the first nine, 10 months were rough. I mean, things didn't, weren't happy at all. And, and, and again, around the 10 month mark, uh, 10, 12 year mark, things started kind of looking normal again. I mean, I started, I kind of like, then I could, I kind of could start to breathe again <laughs> after that. But, you know, ultimately time is certainly uh, your best friend, you know, when it comes to like tank maturity and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, it's probably usually, not, uh, I'm sorry, you know, starting off with SPS may not be, you know, the best, the best idea. I mean, Zoanth is obviously another corals that are way more forgiving, uh, at least will, won't like, uh, discourage you, you know, if they die. I mean, if you put a bunch of acros in a new tank and they all die, it may just, it, you know, the thrill is gone. The thrill is gone. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Just getting some, like an anemones and even leathers, that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. like ease, ease into it, man. Baby steps. I, I suppose. Okay. So good. So one year. And stability. For sure. One year, which which usually time means stability. Right, right. You know? I mean, it's yeah, that's, go, that's they, what it is. It's, it, it's not a. It's not the. I, I guess the time is not really the time, but it's the stability. In order to get stability, that the, the, the right. tank has to be matured. Okay. So now somebody bought your box of battle corals, or somebody won the one thousand dollar box of battle corals. What should they do when they get them? What should they do when they get them? Well, assuming that their tank is ready. I mean, and, and, yes. and one thing, you know, I'm always in, 
good contact with customers, especially when it comes to boxes. Uh, we'll talk about kind of specifics and what they may want, what they may not want, that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. it's not really as random of a draw as you know you may think yes. about, you know at first, but of course. Uh, uh, what should they expect? Or wait, what was the question exactly? What should they do once they receive them? What should how they do? do? You, how do you act, how do you acclimate them? Oh, do you sure, have sure, instructions? Sure. Do you have this? Yeah, I mean, in, in fact, I, I have a little card that I had printed out. In fact, you helped me, helped me proofread it years ago, but. Uh, um, you know, basic instructions. I'm actually not very, uh, uh, I should say, when it comes to acclimating, I don't have a very strict protocol. I mean, I float them and, uh, and that's about it. But essentially, uh, my kind of my dip process that I do after I acclimate is far harsh. I mean, it's the worst thing I put my corals through by far. So, you know, you can mm-hmm. be as gentle as you want, you know, acclimating them. And then they just go into this dip where they pretty much, it's just a scorched earth thing anyway. So, you know, as far as acclimating, I think I just recommend a, 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 a quick temp float. You know, it's really all I really uh, would advise. I mean, I've never had any real problems. Uh, I do think that uh, shipping, you know, a lot of people, I've had stuff, people, they'll get it, they'll be, they'll be like, it was kind of cold. Like, this came in around 70 or 65. And, and the truth is, coral seems to do really well, or I should say it's way more tolerant to cooler temps versus warm. I mean, I always try to err on the side of, you know, if it's going to be warm out, if it's going to be warm afternoon, uh, to kind of take that into consideration when I'm boxing, um, because if they get too warm, they tend to not recover well. If they get too cold, I mean, I've gotten stuff that was in the 40s, you know, on wholesale, and they, it's almost like they're fine. Like, they don't even skip a beat, versus if they're, if they touch 85, then they're probably all going to be brown and smelly, you know, they're kind of that kind of mm. cloudy you know, bag of death look, but... Uh, you know, ultimately, I'm not strict at all when it comes to actual acclimation. I'm an absolute like lunatic uh, when it comes to kind of dipping and, and that whole thing that, you know, to deal with pests and incoming stuff. So, you know, kind of two different animals. But, uh, you know, I guess one thing I try to tell people is try to handle them as little as possible. Like I'll get pictures of like you know, people kind of like holding a coral in the kitchen, you know, like, hey, does this look odd or something? And uh, I mean, I get it. But at the same time, like put it, you know, like if it looks stressed out already, like just put it in the tank, man. I mean, you know, like, you know, don't be like. You know, I mean, there are, they're sensitive enough as it is. And uh, generally, frags are, are quite resilient. I mean, way more so than colonies. Uh, you know, I found, fra- I mean, it's the only way I've been able to be successful. <laughs> you know, the fact that frags are way more resilient and somehow they manage to adapt after being shipped and dipped and all these things that we do to them. Um, but, you know, just be as gentle as you can. If I had one, one bit of advice, it'd be to be as gentle as you possibly can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a- after, from the guy who just said he basically like kills them before he, uh, you know, puts them in his quarantine tank. But mm-hmm. essentially, you know, don't handle them. Don't, you know, don't move around. Don't take them out of the tank and throw them on the table and take pictures. Anyway. Okay. Another customer had, um, um, in just bouncing back and forth here, kind of Definitely. things going around is, um, how, what do you look for when you get corals from, from your wholesaler? How, is there something that you're looking for a uh, pest? How do you, how do you deal with that pest? Um, uh, because people want to know, it's like, I, 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 you know, you've been around for years and I have never gotten any pest from you. And there's a reason why, why yeah, well, like I said, I mean, I, I, I'm a nut. And, uh, you know, this kind of goes back to, you know, way back when I had a wonderful tank, there's a video of it on YouTube. And uh, this was kind of when flatworms were just barely getting out of the scene and I got them and lost all my acros. And that was that. And I've kind of been like, like I said, kind of a lunatic about it ever since. And, uh, you know, I'm just very diligent about it. But uh, um, when it comes to actually picking out stuff in my wholesaler, uh, you know, I, I have the greatest wholesale ever. I mean, I love him. And uh, he treats me really well. I mean, we've gotten to become good friends. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll see stuff. And a lot of times, you know, stuff doesn't always look good, you know, fresh off the boat. And, uh, you know, I guess I've seen enough. I've bought enough to know what a lot of pieces that don't do well, generally don't do well, don't adapt as well to in captivity. I mean, pieces that look great, a good example is spatulatas that, which I think I may have run to the corner of those anyway, but you know, a piece that looks just absolutely insane off the boat. And, you know, after a few months, usually just withers away and dies. And it's like, it's like low hanging fruit and you can't help it. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of pieces, a lot of things I look for. I can, you know, kind of see general tones and, you know, uh, yellow is a good color and, and it may, it may be green and it may be a little brown speck on a, on a tip of like a brown coral, uh, but if there's a hint of yellow in there, like I'll grab it for sure. And things that look anything unique, I mean, a good example would be like my cricket spine that you're going to touch on, but uh, corals that are a little bit different than the usual fare. I mean, not, you know, mm-hmm. I know tenuouses are all the rage these days. And like everyone loves ten- mm-hmm. tenuous and milly, tenuous and milly. Uh, you know, I like stuff that is structurally unique, you know, just, you know, it, maybe even more so than color. A great example would be the old, uh, I'm going to turn back the clock here, uh, my old metal polyp money, which has been, I haven't had it for years, but really kind of a whatever coral and just a weird Monty, super oddball. Uh, 
but I loved it. I mean, you know, it kind of was this brown coral with these weird half silver polyps. Uh, but when it matured and it, and it encrusted for years, I mean, it, you had this ugly whatever on your thing. Uh, after about a couple of years of that, it would grow up and have these really odd branches, super unique. I mean, nothing like it, you know, it, 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 nothing like it really. Uh, so stuff like that, that is a little bit outside of the box. And usually, you know, people ask like, what are your favorites and this sort of thing? And, you know, I generally don't, I mean, I get it like rainbow, you know, tenuous and this sort of thing. I mean, it, it's, it's, it looks great. But you know, we could even we we're just kind of dating ourselves with this discussion. But you yeah. know, back in the back in the two thousand, like tenuous is it was a blue tenuous. Nobody cared, man. You know, <laughs> no, nobody cared. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, but things have changed. I mean. Yeah, things have changed. Things have changed drastically. Um, let's switch back to equipment. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, another element of keeping uh, a farm is flow you have to be able to wash away when you're trimming those corals, that slime, it has to be rinsed away from the coral, otherwise it chokes itself. What do you use for flow? What, what are you using nowadays? Good example, you know, or a good question. I, you know, flow in shallow tanks is hard enough as it is. Like it's really difficult mm -hmm. because you, you're either gonna blast the coral or you're not gonna have enough flow. Like I've got these big long 11 foot tanks and they're only, you know, the water in there is only about nine inches tall. Uh, and I want to fit as much coral in there as possible. So I've got, you know, essentially, long story short, like, and I'm going to plug you here, but the max spec, the, the gyres was, has been the solution big time. And I remember I got a, I got a beta. You guys, were, you sent me a beta back in the basement days. And, uh, and it really was, I knew immediately it was a solution to all my flow problems. I had used all sorts of stuff. I mean, I love Tunzi and, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, some of the Chinese pumps that just crank a lot of flow are good, but in shallow tanks, it's really tough, you know, so I'm kind of pigeonholing myself a little bit, but, but for propagation purposes in shallow tanks, uh, the gyres solved so many problems for me. Uh, I can't really say, speak highly enough about them, truth be told. I've been to your, I've been to your, I mean, and I've been yep, to your you farm right and uh, yeah, there's the, there's the, the big ones and I've been to your farm and, and you have pretty much, you have like two or four gyres per tub almost, if not more. Yep. I've got four now, four in each corner and I have developed, Which, uh, Yep, there it is right there. <laughs> the Which magic. brings me to the next yeah. question. It's like, that's yeah. a lot of power supplies. And I know we talked, we had a conversation about the Wave Engine before. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, just tell us about the Wave Engine and how has it helped you? Well, again, I mean, uh, I don't know if, I think the last time you guys were up, uh, after you left, you know, I had said, Carlos, is there, can you get me like a transformer that can, so I can get rid of some of these blocks, you know, and I, and I still have to wonder if that was kind of the genesis of, of maybe gears turning on how this thing got developed. I mean, we kind of talked about different transformers and is there any way I can like plug in, you know, my, all these, uh, you know, can we do it with one power block? You know, and, and I think like there was some talk and there was some discussion about some things and it never really came to fruition. And then all of a sudden one day you sent me a link and said, hey, check this out. And it was, you know, the wave engine. And, uh, you know, it's my, it's one of my favorite pieces of gear. As, you know, you get rid of all the, all the, the bricks and all that, you know, kind of the corn mush, the spaghetti, and, uh, and the control is very cool. And I, and I can go on and on about how much I love it, but uh, uh, as far as control, and uh, I guess one thing I really like about it, you know, I use the, uh, the gyre, I still have tanks with a couple of the gyre controllers on them, uh, but I've kind of become a firm believer in like a more gentler night mode. And uh, that's mm. one thing you can't do with the, with the gyre, you know, the standard gyre controller. And, uh, you know, short of like all the other great uh, functionality, you know, between pumps and, and different things you can do, uh, it took me a long time to come up with essentially the right direction kind of power in all my tanks. And, and, and I fortunately we don't have videos of that right now, but uh, I get like five minutes of everything going this way. Mm -hmm. And then I get five minutes of everything going that way. And then, and then every, uh, every half an hour we get the Carlos Cane, uh, which is basically all the pumps on <laughs> at hundred percent, which is great. I mean, it stirs up the crap and I mean, that's exactly what you want. And then again, kind of one of my favorite features, and you know, a lot of pumps could do this already, but uh, I couldn't do it with the, with the gyre controllers is the night mode. And I do think that when you turn that, when you turn that flow down at night, they do, uh, it does allow them to kind of feed more or whatever. I mean, they, the pops come out and they just kind of do their thing uh, versus getting blasted uh, all night long at high, at, at, at full speed. So, I mean, I, I really, uh, I mean, I can go on and on uh, about, the, about the wave engine. Uh, probably one of the coolest innovations to come along since the gyre itself. So it's kind of like a perfect little match <laughs> uh, as far as that's I'm concerned. Fan that's fantastic. Yeah, I Another question we have here is uh, pest. And I know you've touched upon it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pest, but you also do quarantine your, your, your corals, right? And yeah. do you use any type of, um, um, maybe I don't want to, I don't want you, maybe you don't want to commit to it, but, or maybe use several ones, but do you use anything to dip your corals? Do you use anything Actually, to yeah. kill? Yeah. 
go ahead. Yeah, I mean, another question, you know, I get asked, we've, you know, lots of discussions about that. Um, and I've gone back and forth. I mean, I've used a lot of the commercial dips and had a lot of trouble early on with, uh, you know, strengths of the dips and, and Coral's not being too happy with that. And, you know, a lot of times, one thing that has a lot that being a vendor has allowed me to do, you know, getting a lot of wild coral in is I find worms all the time. I mean, I get them, I expect to find them. And it's not, you know, my heart still skips a little bit when I find them. But at the same time, like I'm able to kind of isolate these worms and, and, uh, and kind of go to town on them. You know, I can find out, you know, what dips work and what dips don't. And, and essentially, uh, I've been, you know, after many different combinations over the years, I mean, I did the whole Bayer thing for a long time and you know, I got a whole thread about, you know, how I kind of don't like that. Uh, I've settled on uh, a dip from UWC called Expel, which it's at this point, it's safe enough. And it's, I mean, it's, it can be harsh, but uh, it's been effective at killing worms for sure. And I actually add a little bit of uh, polyp lead primer to the, to the mix. I think that's basically a potassium salt dip. And between the two of them, I think the potassium works well for a lot of the pods and kind of little, you know, leggy critters and the, the, the expel is great for worms. So between the two, uh, you know, it's an ongoing thing. I mean, if a, if a better dip comes along, I will, I'm not really that loyal mm -hmm. to the brand. I will latch on immediately. But as of now, like it's a tough balance because you want to kill everything on the coral without killing the coral. And, uh, you know, believe right. me, I killed a lot of coral with dips over the years. It's just one of those things, but I'd rather be, I mean, like I think I said before, I have a scorcher of policy. I mean, I pretty much, it, I bring these things to the brink and then, and then before they go in my QT uh, to ensure that I don't get any pests in my system. I mean, I, I'm like, in that regard, I'm still a hobbyist in that sense. I don't want worms in my system, man. I mean, that's just something, mm -hmm. you know, that it's just, it's a dread. And, and, and I work really hard. Like I said, I mean, I, I've thrown away, I've ditched a lot of coral that if there was any thread of worms, of course, if I find eggs, and you know, I've had this discussion before, any eggs or anything, I mean, it's gone. Sometimes I'll just throw away the whole order if I think it's infested. Uh, you know, these are the measures I take to keep my systems uh, pest free. Do I but have you, little fork tail flatworms and things that like little scavengers on my plugs? Absolutely. But, you know, I, I'd like to think that I've been able to keep my tank free of uh, the, the big ones, the, the bad guys. So Yeah. And you have you have a quarantine tank. So even if even if an oh, yeah. egg makes it through and the problem is with, with eggs, I'm assuming and you've experienced this before, is that the dips don't kill the eggs. Right. Well, that's the thing. Hey, that's why no, I, I don't really mess around. I don't think, is there a dip that actually kills the eggs? There have no. been a couple that have come up, come along that but claim they, they also did, kill the coral. <laughs> well, they never, it never came. It never, yeah. nothing. Right. No, and that's why I said, if I find eggs, uh, and I, the thing is, uh, another thing I really, uh, in, in the inspection process is something that I, I'm very adamant about. I spend more time kind of nooking and, and cranning these things uh, to find potential eggs or, you know, maybe another concern of mine is pests that we don't know about yet. <laughs> You know, I mean, like you've heard about black bugs and certain things that come along. I mean, I have, I mean, my dip is effective against pests that I'm aware of, but, you know, there's a pest that maybe we haven't seen yet or some, something that is going to come along that's going to, you know, terrify us all. I'd like to ensure that I, I kill that one too. And sometimes it means killing the coral. Sometimes it means, you know, like I said, if I find eggs or anything that is even remotely, uh, you know, suspicious, I'll just chuck the coral. I mean, I generally don't put anything, my kind of my rule is nothing but coral. Uh, meaning any rock that's attached to, mm. you know, I mean, it, everything comes off. Any any like inhabitable nook uh, is removed to the best of my ability. Right. To to just ensure Smart. that nothing nothing goes in there. Yeah. Smart. So, okay. No, I mean, I'm, I told you, I'm kind of a lunatic about it. It's just yeah. something that I, I get a little bit crazy. About. Chatting about corals and everything. Let's get to you know we got to the pest, we got the we got the parameters, the equipment. So now I'm. Um, uh, What's up with those names, dude? The names, yeah, yeah. I know, well, I, I can't this, help this goes that. Back to, well, this goes back to a time even before names too, when like, you know, there was such thing, you know, a purple monster came along. It was like, oh, that's hilarious. But yeah, I guess it makes sense, sure. I mean, you know, the, the, the early days of names, you know, when I, was, when I first started uh, selling online and, and uh, it became an actual business, I gave it a shot, man. I mean, I try, well, let me even back up and say that uh, I'm terrible at, at ID and coral uh, anyway, like species wise. I mean, you can take a book and try to take a, a piece of captive grown coral and try to match up the name. And it's harder. I mean, it's not that easy, at least for me. Like a lot of times a like, captive grown coral doesn't even look like the picture, you know, in the corals of the world book that, I mean, you can't, you can't match these up and say, mm -hmm. oh yeah, this is definitely this, you know, obviously tenuous mm -hmm. and the suitors and things like that. Long story short, uh, I tried really hard, man. You could go back on, on uh, reef to reef even and look at some of the threads of me trying to sell packs with the names of actual coral. And you know what? Nobody wanted it, man. They, they wanted, oh. what's this? What's that? What is that? What is that? So that was kind of the genesis of me saying, all right, you know what? Fine. You want names, man. I'll give you names. And, you know, I even started off a little more serious. You know, like you said, the pearly cadaver. Okay. Uh, it was kind of like the pearl berry. I mean, a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is a coral that 
I'll tell you what, this is a, that was a special coral that was kind of handpicked by Kevin up in, in Rhinelander, given to a friend of mine, given to Chad. And we just babied this thing. Like we just thought it was the greatest thing. And that was right when Aussie started coming in. So we had never seen anything like it anyway. But, uh, you know, it was kind of like, it kind of reminded me of the pearlberry a little bit, but it was kind of brown. And, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about these things. It just popped into my head. Boom. Uh, pearly cadaver. There you go. Um, a lot of, you know, and as, and as, you know, time went on, you know, I kind of took it less and less seriously. You've got names that basically make no sense or just some kind of obscure <laughs> pop yeah. culture thing, you know, like phrases and things. I mean, you know, this is not something that I spend a whole lot of time uh, thinking about. Uh, you know, I've got essentially a little wall. <laughs> A little wall of coral names or when I'm begging up and I'm trying to think of something or if, if something pops into my head I'll just write it down and if I can apply that to a coral somewhere down the line uh, that become that's what it is I mean I, I could give you examples but uh, you know ultimately this is not something that I spend a whole lot of time like thinking about mm -hmm. I mean and usually it just comes to my head if I'm listening to a song and like some guy says something kind of strange some lyric oh sure. yeah I mean as simple as that and it's usually pretty obscure stuff I mean whatever you know enough to at least generate some kind of interest and uh, you know the and the longer it's gone on just kind of the more ridiculous it's really gotten so i will say if anyone's to blame and i'm gonna put my finger it's it's you guys <laughs> not you personally <laughs> but you know i tried really hard i tried really hard to sell you know an, an aculus and you know uh, chesterfield you know, all these things and you guys didn't want them you know you wanted you wanted to know what that thing was you wanted me to slap a silly name on it and and I did, boy, I, and I really did. And here we are, you know, yep. ten years later with, you know. Speaking about so so speaking about names and corals, and uh, somebody wanted to know, uh, and this is going to be a tough question. And I've asked you this question before. Um, and I want to know, personally, I want to know if it's the same. It's the same answer, but it's like, what is your favorite coral? And I uh, and I yes. say this parentheses. It's like choosing your fa It's like choosing a favorite child. It, it, it's hard it is but it is well, what it, is your favorite it's tough because i mean i'm gravitating towards stuff, like newer stuff uh you know it always for me comes back to the angelica i mean this is a cool coral this is like a super oddball you know i should have given jeremy the wild pick too uh but like this was a coral that came in pretty average looking kind of aussie had some undertones that i kind of liked and it it, it probably like, the greatest the greatest example of kind of like a metamorphosis from uh, you know, relatively average structure and color wise to this awesome like captive oddball. And, uh, you know, I've really never seen anything like it. It's just kind of like a weird soft pink. It's not a deep water, man. It, it is by no means a deep it water. It looks like it, it looks just, like a very, it looks it like a variation of a Saharsanoi. Right, you know, right. Or something it, it like is, that. It yeah. is absolutely not. In fact, in hindsight, I should have given Jeremy the, the like the actual wild colony pick because uh, it looked just kind of like a nubby rosaria type thing. Uh, mm. But you know, stuff like this, I like. I've never seen anything like it. I've never had anything like it, and uh, and it grows really slow, so I don't have a lot of it. So it's kind of developed. You know, I've been through. You know, me and that Angelica have been through a lot together over the years, essentially, and, and uh, it's just a piece that uh, stands out, like kind of among my entire collection. I don't, like I said, nothing's really comparable, uh, to that. And, and, uh, I wish it grew a little bit faster, but you yeah, know, like, like to don't. answer the question, you know, if someone says, what's your favorite, Angelica's always on the top of the list. And, and yeah. uh, you know, a good example, again, like I said, just a piece that started out as very average and, you know, kind of blossomed into something like I've never seen before. And, and that's actually, that's kind of like getting way back to what we were talking about earlier. Like, that's the thrill for me too. Like I get to see that all the time because I get the stuff in oh. wild. And it, I mean, it always does kind of blossom into something. The way uh, it know. converts into something completely different. Right. It's like, right. and I mean, it's, it's you're just, thrilling. you're just, yeah. Even though you've had the coral for so long, it's still like Christmas day when you get on top of that coral, kill the flow. And all of a sudden you see that. Oh my God! You see that little pink with the red center, and you're like, right. Whoa. "Oh yeah, it's like the greatest yeah. thing ever." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And some, yeah. and sometimes, I mean, just just to watch a coral that doesn't have—I mean, to kind of watch them evolve because there's a there's certainly a massive change from like kind of wild to like captive growth. And uh, and again, that you know, thinking back, like that is for me one of the biggest thrills that I get, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of watch things. And they don't all turn into you know the greatest mm -hmm. things ever, but mm -hmm. you know. Uh, when they do, it is it is about as cool as it gets. There's no doubt about that. And really, my the highlights of my collection were all that's how my collection was built. You know, I buy 50 colonies, and you know maybe some are nice and some are okay. But you know the one and the colonies always die. Like I, the frags grow and the colonies die. But you know all the all the frags that I've grown out from those wild pieces. You know of the of those you know the cream of the crop are the ones that I keep and, and continue to kind of propagate. And, and you know all those funny names. You know they started off as as a wild colony at some point, and um, it's just it's it's a, it's a lot of fun. So what's the next name on the list? Oh, what man. do we have as the next list? Because what I want to do is we're going to use that name 
as the secret code for the draw. So what would, oh. what would the, what would the name, what well, would, what's all right. and we were talking, and we were talking about bringing up some newer stuff. Uh, I got a newer piece again by new. I don't really mean new. Like I usually have a piece for up to a year or two kind of, kind of going back. Like, I know I'll take a frag off a wild piece. I'll roll that out. And, and, and that's what I'll end up fragging for sale. So it's a pretty drawn out process, pretty like brutal actually. Uh, but you know, so by, so by new, I really mean like something that's been in my system maybe a year or two uh, new cause I've decided to finally take a picture of it and post it on mm -hmm. the site. Uh, but the cricket spine, again, you know, don't, you know, cricket spine, that is what it is. Uh, very cool coral, super unique. And, uh, you know, more of a newer piece that just hit the site this year. Uh, if you want to want to make your code, your coupon code, a cool one, that would be the one I would choose. So it's the cricket spine. The cricket spine. Well, and I can even give you a little history. That was kind of a, of a kid cousin to what once was the cricket spine bin, which was another coral of mine that I had back in the day that, that didn't make it. So, uh, so we just put... Things. So oh, we yeah, just put nice. that on the we just put that on the screen. So the code for the draw is the cricket is cricket spine. So you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to go to the form. Uh, it's a tiny little form on the on the website, and we'll make it available on Instagram, YouTube, and and uh, and Facebook. And you put in your email address, put the code cricket spine two words, and then submit, and then you'll be entered into a draw for the one thousand dollar battle box. Cool. That's fantastic, uh, Adam. And how about we'll know, say you'll get? How about we might as well take it a, a notch further and say you'll get one of those too in the box. I mean, by all oh, means, you'll wow. get. Sure, of course. <laughs> I mean, let's just. Hopefully, it's not angle. mine, right? Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <You'll get one. laughs> just kidding, Adam. You know we can. I, I love going up there to your place, and and you're only you know you're only forty five minutes away from me, yeah. um, uh, which is which is I'm spoiled. You know, I wish I could make it up there a little more often, but you know, life gets in the way. But yeah, you know, that, we man. can spend hours just chatting in here. And maybe next next time when when the when the social distancing is no longer a, an issue, sure. I mean, maybe we'll come up there and uh, yeah. sit down. Maybe we'll go to a restaurant and then just right. chat over a over a burger. Yeah, oh, there you or, go. <laughs> That's it. We'll do we'll burger do too. that. But, right but, on. Yeah, and you know what? Like I said, there were. I mean, there was, I think we might have hit over a hundred questions because I posted on Rick Tarif a couple of days ago about what do you want to know? And wow. uh, I mean, I will be more than happy to go and revisit those and either answer them personally. If you want to do this again and open up that can of worms, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm easy, you know where I am, but uh, yeah, by all means, man, we, it's always a pleasure. We definitely, we definitely love having you. We definitely love your corals. Uh, we appreciate always you welcome into your house, um, virtually or through the, yeah, this um, is good. This worked out. I, I, yeah. I was afraid the cat would trip the light or something. I mean, like I was, you know, <laughs> seemed like we did it. We pulled it off without a hitch. Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, everybody, thank you again for visiting us. The the um, we'll put the link to the uh, the form for you to enter the draw. Again, cool. it's put your email address and the keyword is cricket spine all right enter that and then you'll be entered into a draw and you can win the one thousand um, dollar battle box yes. which we will reveal in the few days i think the details are going to be on the link i don't have them off the top of my head but cool. thank you so much adam i think we've oh, you've shared you've shared so many secrets i think people are happy to hear the um all the stuff that you the the, the secrets you had and and i can tell you people it is it works um um and and stability is it. I mean, I have I, think so. So, I, think I so. have a lot of atom corals in my tank, and I've been and I also, I usually send them pictures via text message um, of the corals that I have, mm -hmm. and they look exactly like the pictures on the website. I mean, I can tell That's you, right. you just have to you just have to give them a little TLC and be patient, and you got to be yeah. patient. Yeah, that's a, that's that's the secret. That, that's the secret word of the day, right there. Really, I mean, if you want to come down to it, that's it, it is a patient man's hobby, and acros especially are are you know yes. the, end, the the without a doubt. I mean, what it all. Yeah, so thank you so much for watching. As always, if you're watching on Instagram, make sure you like, make sure you love the video, make sure you love Coral View, make sure you love Battle Box. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that little subscribe button on YouTube, and then there's a little bell also. Click on that bell so you're not notified of the next um, uh, the next episode. And then if you're on Facebook, make sure you like Battle, Bo Battle Corals, make sure you like Coral View, and at the end of the video, you'll see a little uh 
pop up in the middle of the video that says notifications or notify me. If you click on that, it'll notify you next time we actually have a video of Core View. And you know, maybe maybe in a few months we'll come back and we'll actually head over to Battle Corals <laughs> and, and actually pay him a visit and see everything. Oh, yeah. That's always um, good. Anything anything you want to say to your to your customers and a thank you or anything you want to say to them, please. Um, you know, I mean, times are good. I, I'm not gonna say times are good. Uh, Globally, you know, it's been kind of crazy. And in fact, the world is a crazy place right now. But uh, oddly enough, um, you know, FedEx has still been running smoothly. And, you know, I mean, it, with a little, uh, I mean, I don't want you to spend your nest egg, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm still shipping orders every day. So, you know, as far as that goes, feel free to contact me anytime. I mean, I mean, without customers, there would be no battle corals. So, uh, although I, I would still have a tank. <laughs> Either way, man, it's been great, Carl. Always a pleasure, man. I can't wait to see you guys again in person. But, but uh, this was fun, man. It worked. Me too. Me too. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, again, people stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you next time.